I work in university housing. I'm one of those people that when a student is packing up and getting ready to leave their home, and the parents might be a little bit excited to see them go, I'll be on the other end of campus saying, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Let's go find your room, and I'll introduce you to some of these other 218-year-olds that are living in the building. <laughs> I, it's such a wonderful time. I just love working with the, that age group. Um, it's so crazy and chaotic and um, exciting. Sometimes it messes with your brain. But it just takes a little bit of time to figure it out. I've actually welcomed new students every semester for over 20 years, except for one in January 2010, when a new experience of my own started messing with my brain. Nothing made sense. I was hearing voices. Now they'll think I'm crazy, I said. It was 3 a.m. Scott, my husband, was driving me home from the ER. The voices in my head snarked. Oh, now they'll have records to prove it, too. You know your brother-in-law already thinks you have a soap opera job. The voices in their endless radio show had started earlier that week. I thought I heard my neighbors fighting, playing a violent video game. And then they heard me. And then I heard them. And then, could I telecommunicate with them? I can't be crazy. And I was ensnared. Scott had to convince me to go see our family doctor. I barely recall meeting with him. He delivered my kids. Dr. Feigl and his nurse, Faye, had been through all sorts of fevers and earaches that three children can bring. According to Scott, when I walked in for the exam, Faye started to cry. Dr. Feigl met with me and referred me to a neurologist and an endocrinologist. That was an important decision, but I really didn't care because I was with the voices. You see, I presented very much like a schizophrenic, clearly in psychosis, but something wasn't quite right. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, 50% of all mental illnesses are diagnosed by the age 14, 75% by the age 24. I was 40 something, I didn't fit the bill. It wasn't until I felt the blood vessels expanding like tentacles across my forehead that I wanted to do something. I want to stay in this world. I started saying, I want to stay in this world. I want to stay in this world. I want to stay in this world. I was ready to see the neurologist. And that's when my world started shrinking. First, I um, was assigned to the stroke victims floor. When I wandered the halls unescorted, an electronic alarm appeared on my door. A few days later, a doctor on rounds came in, asked how I was doing, and walked out before I could respond. Later, he told my husband to start looking for a nursing home. When I refused meds, the nurse got up in my face and said, don't psych nurse me. She was scared of me, and I could see it. That's when I was transferred over to behavioral health. I didn't want to go. Psych ward, behavioral health. I thought my friend Martin, who does all of the housing assignments, so make sure that students get into the right rooms, had convinced the hospital to move me there. How had he done that? I was so mad with him. I mean, because it was more like a residence hall somehow, because it had functional and utilitary furniture, because it had a bulletin board, because it had roommates and rules. Couldn't they even put up a door decoration with my name? They knew I was coming. <laughs> Behavioral health floors are not like the rooms that you see in a hospital brochure. 
They're much more like the rooms that maybe a naive student who missed a deadline would end up in that hall. I shared a shower with 15 others, one shower. All of my visitors came through a metal detector, including my three-year-old boy. But I was also lucky. It wasn't my first shared living rodeo. I started going to daily activities. Art was my favorite, an hour a day, but not on weekends. Um, I became something of a room hog. I spread stuff everywhere to the annoyance of my roommates. And I started meeting with the head of nursing because I was requesting exceptions and accommodations. But I doubt she remembers me. And I doubt many of you have ever seen a behavioral health floor. Ultimately, I was diagnosed with something called Hashimoto's encephalitis, sometimes, ca sometimes called steroid responsive encephalitis. It's an unusual autoimmune disease. What happens is that your thyroid basically attacks your brain and makes it swell. It looked a lot like schizophrenia when it was um, first presenting. And both of those are brain disorders. And brain disorders are tricky. I mean, really. What would you do if you couldn't trust your brain? I was in the hospital 22 days, hallucinating the entire time. At two months, I was home, lonelier, calmer, and still hallucinating. At four months, I had returned to work for 10 hours a week, but I still wasn't myself. What would you do if you couldn't trust your own brain? How would you manage the indifference projected towards you? How would you manage the feelings that you had, the same feelings for not wanting to be crazy? How would you manage the colleague who you thought picked out your brain with a needle? How would you say hello to the quiet neighbor that you thought was a video game mafioso? What would you do if you couldn't trust your own brain? Hallucinations occur for lots of reasons. Grief, depression, brain disorders, encephalitis. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, one in five will be diagnosed with bipolar, schizophrenia, or a severe depression in their lifetime. You can hallucinate with any of those. Of that one in five, 75% are diagnosed by the age 25. It's a chronic disease of the young. One in five, 20%. 75% of that by 25, 15 out of 100. Instinctively, we want to push those people to the outside edges. We want to distance ourselves. They're abnormal, they're unusual. Some of us might even want to push them over the edge. But what if we can't trust our own brains? Brain disorders are scary. What happens to those brains? Those young brains? Those promising students who live in our residence halls? Who are in our classes? who are in our lives? What happens to their families? Can we consider our language? Some things are crazy, like the stigma attached to mental health and brain disorders. But a person, as a personal descriptor, people probably don't want to be called crazy. Can we recognize hallucinations for what they really are? A lived dream? You don't have to make sense of what a You don't have to make sense of what the hallucination is saying, and you don't 
have to agree. As Parker Palmer said once, one of the hardest things that we have to do is to be present to another person's pain without trying to fix it, to simply stand at the edge of their mystery and misery. Can we recognize that folks hallucinating likely aren't violent and aren't gonna hurt us? But if they cross the line with language or behavior, can we report it with care? Can we start seeing brain disorders and grieve and accept and act with kindness? Although most of my hallucinations were auditory, one of the few visual hallucinations I had was of watching this snow drift out on top of the roof. And I like to watch how the wind changes the outer edge. And as I was watching, brilliant yellows and greens and violets started appearing. And they were brilliant and spectacular and northern lights-like. And as they faded, I consciously thanked my brain for playing with the light in the dark and letting me see. It seemed kind of like a big old welcoming crazy quilt of a door decoration, trusting that with a little time, we'd piece it together. Thank you. <laughs>